All right, good morning, Hacksters. Welcome to Tuesday. I got to turn the volume down on that a little bit. Uh, it's my favorite day of the week, Hackster Cafe. We get to talk with someone doing awesome stuff with hardware. And you've probably seen this person's work recently. So Ben Howard is an aerospace engineer and a robot puppeteer who created the Vanessa Carlton Thousand Miles robot piano cart thingy. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Ben. How would you good describe morning. this project? <laughs> Thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this this project came about a um, few few years ago um, when uh, I, uh, you know, it was mid pandemic and uh, kids couldn't trick or treat properly. Um, so I, I had acquired this uh, food delivery robot um, <laughs> from a uh, a startup that was doing kind of robotic food delivery around town. And, uh, you know, I decided to turn it into a, a Halloween robot. And then after that, I was thinking, okay, well, like, what can I, what can I do with this thing next? What can I do around the city that will just kind of bring random joy to people? Um, and it seemed like a good idea to make a, a piano playing Muppet. It just seemed like something that should exist. So, uh, <laughs> that sort of, uh, that was the direction it went and, uh, it, you know, over the last year or two, it kind of got more and more complicated and more and more involved. And so this is the culmination of it. Well, oh, I didn't notice before this uh, other fluffy thing on there. Is that another robot of yours? Or is that somebody else's? Uh, that is that is an owl that my uh, my friend Noah acquired. And then we put some servos in it. And uh, it, so in, in Vanessa Carlton's video, um, there is an owl that, that is featured momentarily. And so we thought it would be. You know, a nice little, uh, a nice touch to add that as well. So, I have a whole thing of robot owls. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, uh, while people watch that video real quick, if you haven't seen it already, it's a wonderful video. And did you, did you actually get licensing for the music from Vanessa Carlton? No, no. Um, YouTube, <laughs> is, YouTube just deals with that. So, um, so we didn't, as, as long as it's on YouTube, we don't, we don't have to touch the licensing. Nice. Yeah. It's sort of a great system, to be honest. That's super good. Okay, I just had to say hi with uh, oh, incredible. Nano Archimedes here, who's my new little like owl robot. <laughs> His head always falls off. Uh, it's a generational problem, but anyway. Oh <laughs> uh, yeah, well, they're always swiveling, you know. It's sort of yeah. That's what happens when you forget owls. to screw the servo horns on before you apply the head to the robot. <laughs> right. Yes. But ah, this is gorgeous. So um, tell us again. Uh, we. You talked about how this started out as a yeah. Halloween robot. So what was it doing? Yeah. Was it moving around? This is incredibly like. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was really fun. Um, I just sort of I was like, OK, how can I how can I make an experience where kids can trick or treat without having to, you know, walk up to doors when that was still a little bit iffy. Um, and I was like, OK, well, uh, an automated candy dispenser will will work great. And so um, some friends and I put this thing together. This was built at the box shop um, and uh, got this crazy pumpkin guy to, to sit on top of it. And um, it, it was just like a total <laughs> blast. Like it was sort of a multimedia experience. It had a big speaker on it with my friend um, doing voices for it. So it had wow. this sort of intimidating voice that kids were either like, cool with or like nope 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 we want nothing to do with this thing <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but you know you know halloween's supposed to be a little little spooky so i think mm -hmm. we brought that um and it was just like such a blast like we would we would take the thing to various neighborhoods and kids would walk up to it adults would walk up to it they'd try to mess with it uh and we would just you know we'd, we'd work around it it was it was so much fun um so we did that for a few years um and yeah, we'll we'll continue to do it. But it's it's really nice to have something that I can put on this robot now and just take out on a random weekend uh, at a moment's notice just for fun. So yeah, do you plan to keep on going out with it? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I'm I'm excited to to put a few more songs on it um, and to <laughs> uh, to play more play with some of the uh, the lighting and uh, and disco ball features that I haven't really played with a whole lot yet. So. Yeah, so you mentioned in this uh, that you used this tutorial from Puppet Nerd. Are you mm. planning to do more Vanessa Carlton songs or make more of these Muppets and uh, in, in different singers? I, I think, you know, I think the, the idea has always been to kind of dress it up as different people. So, you know, we could do an Elton John, we could do a Billy Joel. Um, <laughs> Vanessa Carlton, though, was so perfect with the piano. But, I mean, I think, uh, I think we <laughs> should probably stop torturing her with this song, which uh, <laughs> she's... 
she's probably i imagine she's, she's probably pretty over it so <laughs> i bet she loves it yeah tell us about adapting this robot uh fun fact actually we we met a few years ago uh when my partner brought me to visit your house and you had this robot platform just like a kind of bare platform and i guess like go kart around on it a little bit in the garage and it can go pretty fast and yeah. uh i'm curious if you did like any kind of like you know gearing or torque control or how you interface with this thing like yeah it's awesome. you know i have to say that the approach that it's funny i actually have a friend who has another one of these he took a totally different approach my approach was sort of just like all right the thing mostly works i had to totally refurbish the batteries and so on but um I, I, to some degree, treat a, a lot of it as a black box. Um, it was built by a company that was actually intending to put this on the street um, with, you know, the public. And, uh, and because of that, they needed to make it really safe. Um, mm -hmm. And so some of the features that came with that were um, it has power off brakes. So if power is lost, the mm -hmm. brakes slam on and the thing is just totally safe. Um, and it has a safety rated wireless uh, e-stop. So I was sort of like, you know, I don't, I don't really feel like messing with any of those guts here. Like they did all this work to make it safe and I'm operating it around little kids. So I was like, let's, let's keep that the same. Um, and uh, so mo for the most part, what I've done is I've added kind of, I've added 120 volt power to it. Um, I've upgraded the antennas. I've just sort of done a lot of work to make it more robust for what I'm using it for here. Um, what? So. And you mentioned antennas, so you've got a remote control system. How does that mm -hmm. work? What control yeah, are you using? Um, it, it's quite simple. Um, it's just an RC car remote system, and ah. that feeds into the the onboard computer that they had implemented. Um, so, and then there's a little sketchy switch on the side that enables the turbo <laughs> mode. But for the most part, it's <laughs> it's set up in a, a slower speed mode that <laughs> can't go too wrong before you figure out that that something's happening. So, you know, I feel like. I don't put enough turbo mode on my projects. Right, Why right. Does everything have turbo mode. Yeah, yeah. And what exactly does that do? Does that give you like higher speed, lower torque? Or... Um, I think it's just um, limiting the top speed. Um, so there's there's actually it, it actually has proper speed control. Ah, uh, um, yes. Which is, to be honest, actually a, a a bit more trouble than it's worth. Um, I would prefer more of a direct link between the remote control and the wheels. Um, but but it has this weird quirk where because it's because it's using speed control based off of an encoder that's on one of the wheels, it it turn it, it goes left faster than it goes right. Oh no! <laughs> Which can be very <laughs> off-putting when you're trying to ride it um, or drive it. So, um, but actually, coincidentally, my friend um, has another one of these, and he's he's going much more uh, much deeper into the guts of the thing to make it run off of a higher voltage lithium packs. His goes way faster than I would ever be comfortable taking mine. So I'm I'm taking more of a conservative approach here. And uh, that makes sense. It I mean, especially if you're not like writing it yourself and you're gonna have it around kids and stuff. We yeah. appreciate that as the public. <laughs> yes, the, the public is, is safe the robot. Um so inside of here, you've got well, you've got a bunch of 3D printed parts. Uh, mm -hmm. I see some some slicer stuff. I see some uh, modeling stuff that looks like it might be done in like SketchUp or something. Can you tell us about your process here? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, the one thing that I've gotten really excited with over the last few years is Onshape. Um, oh, yeah. Have you have you tried it? I love Onshape. I do like all my projects in there. Oh, yeah. It, it um, it, It's really incredible. I, I had gotten so discouraged with SolidWorks over the last 10 years. You know, I in college, SolidWorks was like the coolest, like new CAD program that was replacing all of the kind of stodgy old ones. And then it just degraded over the course of, of 10 years. And Onshape has just been a total breath of fresh air. Like I've just gotten excited about mechanical design in a way that I haven't been in a long time. So uh, yeah, this was a great, great excuse to do everything in Onshape and uh, just really kind of kick the tires of it and see, see what I can do. So. <laughs> yeah. Were there any uh, features you found especially helpful in in doing this? Um, I I found that the Onshape Part Studio capability is really powerful. Um, so for for folks who aren't familiar, um, Onshape rather than uh, Onshape sort of guides you toward designing parts in tandem, uh, kind of in the same interface, so that they fit together naturally. 
um, where SolidWorks was more sort of guiding you toward having a single file per part. Um, and so it, it makes it really great for adding fasteners. Like I will have two parts and then I will add a third part that represents the negative feature that belongs in both of those parts. And then I'll do a Boolean operation and I just have the, the exact perfectly shaped hole and all of the features just in place. Um, so it just has a few um, just really well thought out features like that um, that just kind of make it a joy to use. So yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan. Solid. And uh, when it comes to the robot insides, so we've got the the RC car part from the marble robot. Right. Then you've got this amazing Muppet you put together. I probably shouldn't say Muppet, uh, yeah. but you know. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. <laughs> puppet, puppet uh, with a P. Yep. How many uh, servos in, uh, did you put in here? And what kind of controller have you got going on here? Is it on the same remote control as the car? I've got so many questions. Okay. So oh, yeah. What, yeah, so what, what, is, what are you like? like? <laughs> No, yeah, all good. Yeah, the, the car part is, um, I, I sort of treat that as a block and I try not to mess with it too much just because of the safety issues, but everything above the surface of it is all all custom and all runs off of a different system. Um, so yeah, the, the puppet itself, um, the body of it or the skeleton has um, six servos in it, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so it has um, a waist uh, forward and back movement. It has a shoulder side to side. Um, it has... Um, a neck um, side to side as well. And then it has um, a head tilt, so it can do this. Um, and then it, and then the upper and lower jaws are each independent. So when they're moved in tandem, the whole head pitches. And when they're moved opposite each other, the mouth opens and closes. So <laughs> I love how the hair also gives it an extra bit of dynamic movement. Yeah, <laughs> totally. It's a little bit of uncontrolled mayhem. Good stuff. Yeah, it was it was also just uh, one thing I did not expect was some of the reactions from kids around this thing. Uh -huh. Like so many kids came up and just just fixed the hair. You know, they see the ah. hair is in the face and they're just like, oh, we got to get that out of her. <laughs> uh, totally unprompted. It was just uh, it was so it was so wholesome. There's one adorable part where there's like, I think it's around like 130 or something. Someone commented and I had to go look where there's like a little, little girl, girl that like Oh yeah, there like she runs is after it. it and <laughs> Yeah, I think it's right after this here. So cute. I guess I I guess I should know. I haven't seen this <laughs> about a thousand uh, times. So yeah, she most... that, this little girl in pink, I mean, she followed us around for literally two hours. You know, what kind of what child that age has an attention span of two hours? Um, but yeah, she was was her dad was just like, Well, I guess I guess this is how we're spending our day. And uh it, it was just a blast. That's good parenting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What do you do to, so with you know, any kind of robotics that go in the real world, there's a certain amount of durability that you have to consider. Uh, what mm. tends to break the most on this and how, how do you reinforce it? You know, I have to say that, um, that almost nothing is broken on it. Um, oh, nice. I, I, I put a lot of thought into that um, up front. Um, and, but I, I'm, I honestly am I'm pretty surprised at it. Um, the, the one um, area that we had the most difficulty was with um, temperature in the head. Ooh, um, yeah. and, and one of the issues is that the puppet, it, it requires a significant amount of force to actually get it closed to the point that when you watch it playing, you perceive like a B or a P or a closed mouth consonant. Um, right. and so you actually really need some significant force to kind of work against the, um, the foam of the mouth. And so those servos, you know, if the default mouth position is close to close, there there's potentially a lot of current running through those servos if they're not geared um, pretty significantly. Um, so I was using some um, kind of lower gear ratio, um, higher speed servos, and they uh, they were just frying themselves in the head, or at least oh, one. No. Of them. Um, so you know that was sort of that was something that I figured out before we even took it out on the street. Um, but she now has a little hat embedded in her skull, which is a, uh, a, a cooling fan. Uh, and the servos have been switched to, to some that are beefier. So yeah, there, there it is. I like these hook and eye fasteners for, um, for attaching it together. Mm. Yeah. I've used Velcro on robots before and that's, you know, it's, it's not super durable, but this seems like yeah. it'd be quite sturdy. Velcro just feels like it should be better. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And like when you're trying to pull it apart, you're like adding all this stress on the fabric. So I might yeah, have to bother sure. that idea. But okay, so back to the topic of durability. You yeah. know a lot about making things durable, presumably, because you're putting robots in space. Yeah, yeah. So tell us about your day job. Yeah. Um, so for the last 10 years um, or a little bit more, I've worked in aerospace. Um, so I started my career at NASA Ames um, in the South Bay area. Um, and there I was working on very small satellites, nanosatellites, CubeSats. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with them. Um, and and those, those satellites at NASA were demonstrating the use of cell phones as the core processor of a spacecraft. Um, you know, we had a manager there who would um, always take his phone out of his pocket and say, like, why are satellites so expensive? Like, we have everything we need in this phone. And <laughs> so my managers at NASA were just like, well, let's let's give it a shot. Um, and so we uh, we built a few generations of satellite with cell phones in them. Uh, and they work great, they, although they were not in space for very long. Uh, so mm -hmm. that longevity is really the, the Achilles heel of that approach, but uh, is there a name for the phone cube sats? Is it like phone sat or something? Phone sat was the name ah. of the project. Yeah, um, yeah, it was go. a lot of fun. It 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 took just took photos with the cell phone's camera, and then we had an additional radio that we had to strap onto it, um, and it would beacon those photos down over um, over ham radio bands, and you know, enthusiasts all over the world could collect the packets, and we reassembled them into some photos. So oh, it was a very cool. nice. Program crowd uh crowdsourced approach to ground stations that's rad and it looks like this was solar powered with some really interesting configurations of the panels on here yeah um yeah those are called task cells t-a-s-c um triangular something 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 and uh they are the edges of the silicon wafers because you know you, to tile these solar panels on a typical satellite you want them to be rectangles so that they actually fit next to each other but you're cutting them out of a circular uh oh. circular chunk and so those corners uh get turned into those little triangles uh so they're much cheaper by area than um than buying the real proper cells however they are in my opinion not worth it <laughs> oh no why not i mean they're, cheap. The work? they're great for um for student projects maybe but the amount of the hoops you have to jump through to integrate these things are pretty significant. And um, you're just in incorporating so many more points of failure. Um, you, you know, the, it's the interconnects that are going to fail, right? Mm. Uh, as, as with any project. And uh, you're just, you're introducing so many of them here if you have this large number of triangular cells. So, um, Is this, are you connecting the cells to the board via a surface mount resistor or something here? Uh, yes. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, our technique here was to use um, to actually just pick and place all of this stuff. Um, mm. Part of the reason that integrated solar panels are expensive is the labor in assembling them. Um, now, you know, the resistors were sort of a double edged sword because they were really they were cheap and easy to to affix. But there's um, there's not really any great strain relief between the board and the cell. Right. So we would periodically find that they would pull off a chunk of the cell um, with thermal expansion and so on. So, Ooh. so you know, there is over these aerospace project, we've, we've, we've found a few kind of really interesting hacks that we can use to save cost and just do things just as well. And we've also found a bunch of cases where we're like, all right, I see why they do it this way in the industry. Uh, turns out, you know, turns out there was a reason. So we have a question from the uh, audience. Jamie asks, where can I get one of those fun cart robots to hack? And I looked on eBay just now and I don't see any of these. But um, yeah, maybe I you, mean, got, I, you can find this though. I, I I would in general just say uh, keep an eye on auctions, um, and and pay attention to the news uh, when a uh, if 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 another um, well you know th this this was sort of interesting. This uh, these robots came about just because they were changing the generation of robot. Uh -huh. um, and so uh, it wasn't like a fire sale or anything. It was just sort of like, all right, we're moving to a different size and we don't have enough space. So, you know, I wish I had a good answer to that question. But um, but I mean, th the way that most people do it is you take a wheelchair. Um, so um, if someone is kind of is upgrading their wheelchair and getting rid of their old electric one, um, find it on Craigslist and go pick it up um, and add some motor controllers. Um, that's 
a, a pretty simple way to do it. Um, th this robot was actually built on top of a mobility scooter. Um, so before it was a food delivery robot, it was a mobility scooter. So. Ah, yes. So back on this uh, photo thing, we've got all these beautiful photos of the insides and stuff. Mm -hmm. Is this like, were you, did you <laughs> do like a face tracking thing in order to model the robot singing? Yeah, I, I thought that would be kind of an interesting tidbit. Um, yeah, I, I initially um, was doing most of the control of the puppet with an iPad. Um, so I just kind of generated this interface with touch osc um, the whole thing uses midi um, and so i could just kind of use off the shelf tools add sliders you know just kind of and i'd move a slider and the puppet's head would move and the mouth would open and i would sort of do that and attempt to sync it with the song as it was playing in the background and um it really didn't i never got to a point where it really looked that natural and i was just thinking you know all right maybe i'll just try doing motion capture um, and see whether i can get something more natural so yeah, I just stuck some masking tape to my lips and lip synced the song to my camera um, and stuck it in After Effects and uh, <laughs> then just wrote a script to just do some subtraction and normalization of the uh, the mouth openings. And then and it, it was interesting. It worked it worked really well, but it was actually too natural to start with. And I had to kind <laughs> of learn to really, uh, really exaggerate all of the mouth movements as if I was a puppet. So there's a video of me doing that and I'm absolutely not going to share it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh wonderful let's yeah. see mm -mm 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 -mm. yeah let's talk a little bit more about space robots <laughs> so what is it exactly that you do at planet yeah um I mean, I know your title on here is chief spacecraft architect so what's your day-to-day yeah. -day like yeah um so i you know i'm actually uh, i i've actually kind of extracted from planet so I, at this point i'm I'm basically an advisor, um, but uh, but I can talk about the last ten years there. Um, yeah, I, um, I I started off my degree is in mechanical engineering, so I started off doing um, most of the the structural work for the satellite, as well as a lot of the electrical work, just because we didn't we didn't have people to do it. Um, so it was a lot of PCB layout and uh, just kind of endless <laughs> PCB layout, um, but. Uh, yeah, sort of, I worked at sort of the intersection between the structure and the electrical system. Um, and then over the course of 10 years, I sort of just learned more and more about designing for the space environment and sort of morphed into a, a, an aerospace systems engineer. Um, so I'm kind of most comfortable uh, working on the aspects of the spacecraft design that really require knowledge of the space environment and the launch environment and that sort of thing. So. Yeah, so when, whenever we have a, um, whenever we would have kind of a new concept for a spacecraft design, um, like someone might say, all right, like we're looking to branch into higher resolution imagery. And we have this idea to achieve that by flying the satellites at a very low altitude. I Ooh. would then say, okay, well, what are the ramifications of flying a satellite at a low altitude? You know, you get to use a smaller telescope, but you might need propulsion and you really need to understand the drag environment. So that was sort of my day to day. I would pick apart the components of these new projects and sort of kind of deep dive in the ones that were really critical to the project success at a particular case. Fascinating. <laughs> I love how, okay, so I just have to point out that on these uh, particular space robots, you have these uh, such artistic side panels and solar panels. And those are actually from your uh, artist in residence from Absolutely. back in the day, Forrest Stearns, right? Yeah, and he, he became, I think, our art director. So he, he actually, at, at, at some point, ended up full time, and he was coordinating that that program. So so cool. Uh, yeah, we've we've always emphasized uh, art at Planet, and I think one of the coolest things we've done is um, Forrest painted some of the ray domes over our ground station antennas with these kind of beautiful patterns. Um, so those were really, really incredible, and I think it's not not something you 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 see anywhere else. Wow. <sighs> Just side note, we have a demand from the audience to release the lip syncing video. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of, yeah, speaking of videos, you've actually got, this is not your first internet sort of blow up success. In fact, uh, you've got a video from 10 million views from 14 years ago. Yeah, uh, right. Where you were doing this cool stuff with non-Newtonian fluids on a speaker cone, which uh, I 
did, did you originate this? Because I remember doing this at a hackerspace in 2009, which is after you released this video. Did you take yeah. inspiration from somewhere else? Or were you the first person to sort of do this and put it on the internet? You know, I am i don't think I can take credit for the idea of putting it on a speaker. Um, I think um, I think one thing that I did do with this, I, I think I just kind of filmed it in a, in a way that was nicer than some of the other YouTube mm. videos that were up. Um, I, the real the real key was just syncing the speaker <laughs> with the frame rate of the camera so That's that you don't end up with a blurry mess. Um, so, yeah, it was I did not expect this to take off like it did. Um, it, it, that was it was such a blast. I always say that it paid for my beer in college, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah. So uh, non-Newtonian fluid, for those who don't know, is this your standard cornstarch and water situation? Yep. Yep, standard cornstarch and water. And what exactly does a non-Newtonian fluid do? Yeah, so, um, you know, uh, for a typical fluid like water, you know, if you're moving your hand through it, the faster you move your hand through, the more force you experience. Um, with an, a sheer thickening fluid like this, that uh, experience is uh, is even more significant. So the, the fluid almost uh, starts to become a solid the faster you move your hand through it, so... Um, there are there are sheer thickening fluids that do that, and there are, there are sheer thinning fluids like ketchup, where you know they're very viscous in the bottle, but when you start to shake it, they suddenly start to slip, and you know all the ketchup comes mm. pouring out. So um, it's all it's all a question of how the fluid's viscosity changes as a function of the shear, uh, aka how fast you're moving your hand through it. So. so if you really want your ketchup to come fast, come out fast, maybe you should mount like a base, like a subwoofer speaker to it. I think um, that would work beautifully yeah i'm i'm sure someone has tried that uh <laughs> yeah. i gotta look this up now real quick catch up yeah. on a speaker okay but in the meantime you also have a couple of other awesome videos uh, i was just interested because you've done you've continued to do stuff with fluids and uh sonic acoustic stuff so we've got yeah. um these videos beautiful videos that you made uh Around yeah, the, so um, this, this was actually um, this was actually totally unrelated to the non-Newtonian fluid thing. Um, this was this was from my um, my undergraduate thesis, which was mm -hmm. on ultrasonic atomization, um, which is surprisingly poorly understood, or at least was at, at that time. Um, so I was sort of just doing this exploratory work, where I was just you know using some of these ultra high speed cameras that had just become available to just look at what was happening and, and attempt to understand it from that perspective rather from that rather than from the kind of physics underpinnings of it. So it was sort of a nice um, incorporation of my my video interest with with science. So got yeah. some ideas out of it, which was which was great. Are there any other I know that you said this wasn't intentional that these were both sort of like liquid things that <laughs> with like high speed video, but are there any other experiments that you'd love to do in this vein? Oh boy, that's a great question. Um, you know, I I was most excited about it when high speed videography was just becoming a thing. You know, I used to like make air guns and shoot them through different things and take oh, high yeah. speed photos of it. And um, it's 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 become a little bit harder now because it feels like everything has already been done. Um, there's so many great YouTube channels with with high speed video. Um, so I'm not sure exactly what I would what I would do next with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Well, let's talk about tools. Um, so you've played with high-speed cameras and stuff. Is there another tool that you would be really excited to upgrade your lab with? What If you could like have unlimited resources, what would be the next thing you would get? Yeah. I, I mean, one thing I've been really excited with recently, um, you know, we talked about Onshape a bit, but... Um, I'm just, I'm really excited about kind of the next step in mechanical engineering pipelines, mm. um, like pipelines from starting from concept and getting to a, a functional device. Um, and I, I've, I've started, started to get excited about certain components of it, um, like, um, like VR, AR. Um, mm. So at this point, I, um, I now have incorporated the Oculus into my workflow. So a lot of times I will just kind of sketch an idea in 3D um, and you know, you can just, you know, design a part and then move it around, figure out how it works with another part. And once you get to an idea that you think will fit together, then you can go into the precision CAD and, and, and really figure out the details of it. But I think having that intermediate step kind of between paper sketch and CAD is super valuable. 
Um, so I'm really excited about, um, like everything feels really kind of hacky right now. Like the AR experience with Oculus is just sort of like a byproduct of the cameras that they have there for tracking that then they allow you to pass through in the app that I use, which is Gravity Sketch to kind of design um, around the room. Um, so I'm excited to see where that goes. Um, and then the, the one component of it that I feel like I'm missing is, is really good 3D scanning. Um, I'm, it seems like every, every few years I search the web for whatever like new 3D scanners out there and I always get more excited, but still nothing feels like it's quite what I want. Mm. So I'm, I'm feeling like we're within five years of having that, um, having that perfect tool. Uh, yeah, I've been looking for that too. And uh, the I think the closest thing that I've found is something called Canvas, and then there's another one called like Scandi Pro or something like that. It's always mm -hmm. I'm always also always trying because we have lidar cameras built into so many of these devices now, like iPhones, iPads. Uh, it seems like there's got to be one that sort of sets itself apart, even if it's just sort of a, like a low res thing, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I think they're. Um... I think they're close. Um, I, I've seen a few really, really killer ones for under 8,000, which is like, and they, I think they have this one company, which I'm totally forgetting the name of, but they have them, I think, down to 1,000. Um, and it's starting to get to a point where you could at least like maybe buy one and share it with some friends or with mm. a, a hacker space. <laughs> um, yeah. Not quite at the level of kind of individual hobbyist, but, uh, but boy, I, I really think it's close. Um, next few years, hopefully. Nice. So yeah, just, you know, just being able to scan something, throw that into AR, um, design around it, put it into CAD, take dimensions, um, even be able to just kind of do Boolean operations with an existing object to generate a bracket to attach to it. You know, that is just going to speed things up so much. Yes, um, absolutely. Like so much time, wasted time just with calipers, like measuring things all over. And it's like, <laughs> I would love to not do that anymore. Someone in the comments says uh, Samuel jumped in with Luma AI. Looks yeah. like this is a some kind of that's AR. A phone, uh, that's a phone-based one. It looks like rather than uh, having its own dedicated hardware. Yeah, interesting. I'm not familiar with that, but we'll have to check it out. iOS app, yes. Hmm. Yeah, cool. Curious. Mm -hmm. Um. <laughs> Oh yeah, you mentioned hackerspaces, and uh, yes, thank you. And uh, I know that it's not exactly a hackerspace, but this seems like a great spot to mention quickly the box shop. Can you tell us about the box shop? Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, the box shop is um, this amazing kind of uh, artist workspace um, in Hunter's Point in San Francisco, where folks who want to do kind of large scale, typically metal art projects can come and work with other like-minded people to turn them into reality. So it's uh, a number of shipping containers arranged around the central concrete area um, and has this warehouse space that has a bunch of welding equipment, CNC plasma cutter, um, some a, a great machine shop. So it's just like, I don't know. I, I love it. It's, it's it's just a it's always just like a, a joy to 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 go and work there. <laughs> so yeah, this was this was a the the Muppet or the puppet was a a, a product of the the box shop for sure. Could not yeah. could not have done it in my apartment. So yeah, and the box shop right now they're um they're currently in in the process of figuring out um potential relocation just because of lease issues. Oh, so, um, you know, know if that. anyone's interested in getting involved or wants to donate to the cause, that's a, <laughs> that's an option for sure. Yeah, just go to the uh, box shop in the links below. By the way, uh, as usual, lots of links in the description below uh, relating to the stuff that we're talking about, but you can go help save the box shop. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, it's an incredible place if you are a Burning Man person. So many of your favorite uh, pieces of large art have had their genesis or been completely built here. Charles Gattakin does a lot of stuff out of here. Uh, the Flaming Lotus Girls, just mm -hmm. amazing people doing amazing stuff. Wow. Wow. Love it. Does yeah, I mean, the, San Francisco continuing to be a kind of weird artistic place uh, relies heavily on the continued existence of places like this. So it's 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 very, very important that they that they continue on. Yeah. Quick sidebar. Uh, is this Vanessa Colton? 
Ruben, is. as I called it. Yes. <laughs> they, they, got, they got to meet. <laughs> so <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, yeah, we we took it to her show um, in Petaluma. I was I was very ambivalent about this, but it was uh, it was it was on April Fools, so I, I couldn't couldn't resist. Uh, so I was I was convinced by my friends, uh, and it was and it was great. Like she 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 had us bring it out back so she could hang out <laughs> with it and see it do its its little thing. And I think it seemed like she she had a great time. So. I bet she loved it. Yeah. I bet she'd never seen anything like that before. Like it, like what a way to I don't know. It's definitely not something that you usually come across as an artist, I think. No. Amazing. No. So, no, uh, I'm not expecting that. <laughs> music and art wise, uh, oh, you yeah. also play mandolin and I you do, share yes. tabs. Yep. Here are some three random <laughs> quasi embarrassing tabs that I have here. But, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know. uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm big into mandolin. Um, been playing for, for five or six years, but I grew up playing violin. So they, they share, um, they share strings between them, so it's it's easy to go back and forth. So, same, yeah. Uh, I switched to an octave mandolin recently because oh, it really? Was more comfortable. Cool. Oh yeah, we should have a mandolin jam. Oh, oh my god, absolutely! I had no idea. <laughs> yes, <laughs> but the reason that I ask is, uh, you know, you have a variety of interests. Do you ever mingle your electronics and music interests together? Well, obviously, you made a piano playing robot, but like. Mm, uh, right. But she's sort of like fake, fake playing it, she's you know. Playing, yeah. uh, I'm curious if you meld your interests in other ways. Yeah, I um, not beyond kind of just little personal projects that I need for my mandolin. So I've made kind of holders for pickups for it. Um, I've made an iPhone holder for it. So if I'm out camping or Ooh. something, I can have my tabs there. But um, yeah, I've never done anything too involved. I'm I'm kind of far. I've I've thought a little bit about developing a um, a pedal board that's suitable for instruments with um, passive piezo pickups. Um, it really seems there only seems like there are like three of them out there, um, and they never it never feels like they have what I want. So I've I've thought a little bit about that, um, and I'm also I'm also super far from being an audio purist. Uh, I love the idea of just being able to buy like a ten dollar op amp and just and just base the thing around that. Just be like, I don't have to consider any of the kind of passive considerations that you would typically have to worry about here. I'm just gonna <laughs> brute force it with the the nicest op amp money can buy, and uh, and go from there. So that's oh, been yeah. in the back of my mind. But I it's still gonna be way less expensive than like the cheapest like audio actual like interface thing magic. Totally. <laughs> right. Uh, so you can get an instrument grade op amp for ten bucks and. You know they're not going to design that into some mass mass produced product, but as a hobbyist, it's perfectly fine. So, I have this dream where for a while I really wanted to build a mandolin with a whammy bar on it, and oh, obviously cool. that's going to work better with an octave mandolin where there's actually some like room to stretch. I feel right, like, right. but uh, now I'm thinking maybe I could do that electronically. That would be oh, like yeah. super cool, like that's one of those. Think how cute a tiny bender. tiny mandolin uh, uh, whammy bar would be. Yeah, you know, so if you cute. could make that work, it would be incredible. Oh my god, <laughs> I'm definitely not a luthier, but you know, with electronics, maybe through the power of electrons. Mm, yeah. Let's yeah, backtrack a little bit and um, tell me what your favorite PCB software is. You mentioned that you make some PCBs, so like, what your favorite EDA would be? Yeah, um, I, uh, I, I think I have favorite aspects of two of them. So I've only ever worked mm -hmm. with Eagle and um, an Altium. Mm. I um I love I loved Eagle. Um I, I really um I really got to a point where I, I really thought I was pretty fast at it. I felt like I really deeply understood um the data structures behind what, what was going on, which I think was really enabled uh en enabled me to do a lot in terms of scripting that I wouldn't have been able to do otherwise. Um so I um I, I, I sort of came up on Eagle um, and then Planet switched to, to Altium. And so I went along with that. Um, and, you know, my first experience with Altium was also more scripting, figuring out how to do all the importing from Eagle, which was super, super painful. Um, mm -hmm. I was, um, I, I appreciate um, all of the advanced capabilities of Altium. I also think that there's some fundamentals that they have not executed on well. Um, I think the library management is really, really poor. Um, in Altium, and I actually, I thought Eagles was way, way uh, better thought out. Um, I don't know if you've, have you encountered the kind of uh, DB lib stuff in Altium? 
I have not. I've only worked in KiCad, really. Okay, yeah. A little it, bit of Eagle, but... They, they really... Um, to enable certain functionality that Eagle just has by default, you have you you have to have Excel installed, and you have to be generating Excel yeah. sheets that then map one part to another part. You know, it, it's possible this has improved in the last five years, but I, I remember it being just very painful. So, you know, I I wish I could say that I I had a tool that I really loved there, but um, but I I don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, is there a reason that you would you still use Eagle for your personal projects and things? I think when I was um, doing more PCB stuff at Planet, I was really trying to use Altium just to kind of um, flex that muscle a little right. bit and um, and just get better at it. But at this point, I would probably just go back to Eagle um, or or try KiCad potentially. It's it's not something I've used. So yeah, I do like it. I yeah. recently upgraded to KiCad seven, and somehow it broke all my libraries right. though. So I'm like, no, is this it's, normal? It's always it's always the libraries, you know, and it's always the basic stuff that that seems like it should be just nailed down, and it and it never is. <laughs> <sighs> someday we'll have this. We'll have yeah. nice things someday. <laughs> so is uh, that a piece of software that you do? You feel like it's a joy to use at at this point? Um, do you I get a do. Kind of like it's just that it will be once again once I figure out this library situation. <laughs> I was using parts libraries from Adafruit and SparkFun, and so it seems you know I haven't I haven't really dug into it, but it seems like maybe I'm gonna have to wait for them to like redo those or like figure out a way to uh, morph them over myself into um, maybe I maybe the, uh, there's a way to like just adapt it. But yeah, anyway, mm. anyway, we'll see. Yeah. Um, so That's tell what us. You have to do. <laughs> <laughs> I find your work really inspiring tell us about your inspirations oh yeah um i mean i guess i'll i guess i could start the puppet and the aerospace are so so different i guess i'll start with the puppet mm. um i have really just recently um gotten excited about doing art projects like that that can be experienced by just random people who are walking by on the street mm. i really love the idea of um people just kind of being out for a coffee and stumbling upon something crazy that they didn't expect. Um, so I'm sort of inspired by the potential to create experiences like that. Um, and I love it when uh, art from that, that is made for Burning Man ends up brought to San Francisco or other cities and displayed in a way that other people can see it. Because I think a lot of effort goes into Burning Man art that ends up only being seen by Burning Man <laughs> participants, which I think mm -hmm. is it a huge shame. Um, so I've been trying to focus my efforts on things that can be seen um, outside of outside of festivals. Um, so I just in general love the idea of creating weird experiences for people just kind of out in the world and just kind of breaking up someone's day in a way that they didn't didn't expect. Um, Has this so, happened to you? You know, that's a good question. Um, I I mean, I think um, I'm not sure I've actually seen so many um, just unexpected art projects. I've seen um, some pretty successful installations um, that came from from Burning Man. Um, uh, Charlie, who runs the box shop, has has made a bunch of these um, like really kind of high quality welded um, pieces of art that can withstand the real world. And so um, some of his trees were in Golden Gate Park. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just just super beautiful. And um, it's just like a great experience if you're there in the evening. They're, they're down now, unfortunately. But um, it, it was just, yeah, exactly. Here we go. Um, it's just such a great kind of inspirational experience to walk through that. So um, Yeah. And one thing I really liked about this one was that they had QR codes on there that you could use to control those. So there was sort of an interactive element with uh, oh, people yeah. walking by. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really, really well done. It's sort of it's sort of taking a project and going that extra mile, that extra eighty percent to really get it to a level of polish um, that it it can withstand the world and be operational for some significant amount of uptime. And I think that um, when that amount of effort is put into a project, it's really really appreciated by people and really noticeable. So, speaking of uh, withstanding the. Uh the pressures, the stresses of being out in the real world. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about the differences between designing for something to roll around on Earth versus something that's mm -hmm. got to go in space. You mentioned temperature differentials, like ripping apart your uh, your, <laughs> your resistors and solar panels earlier. But, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I think um, 
there are some there yeah there there are a few things that are different i mean the the main the main difference i would say is the ability to make a fix when something goes wrong um mm. you know when something goes wrong with a satellite if it's a if it's a piece of hardware that's actually truly broken you're not going to go up to fix it um even if you know you, you may have even designed the thing so that you don't have uh, remote access to a particular diagnostic port that you need. And, you know, if a problem goes wrong that requires access to that port, you're just out of luck if you haven't built that in. Um, so I think that is probably the most significant difference, I would say. Um, and then the, the environment obviously is pretty different, but it's, you know, I mean, the space environment is an environment just like any other. You, um, you become an expert in the environment and you design to it, um, you know, underwater stuff is an, also an extremely harsh environment with very different constraints mm. and I would be terrible at designing something uh, to go underwater uh, just because it's not an environment that I'm familiar with. Um, so, I mean, you know, space does have some, the radiation is a huge pain just because it's so hard to test. Um, it, it's just expensive and complicated to do ground testing for that. So, you know, that's a, that's a pain. Um, but I also think that there are a lot of aerospace lessons that can be incorporated in um, Earth-based uh, uh, devices, like you know, there are a lot of things that I thought about in making this puppet that uh, sort of came from my aerospace background. Um, just you know, designing for high vibra high vibration of launch. Um, I really spend a lot of time oh, yeah. thinking about uh, strain relief of wires. You know, such a basic thing, but you know, I that that has been probably the number one failure mode of my projects over the last 20 years is strain relief. You know, that was something as a kid, I, I would always have wires breaking off of boards and so on. And, you know, so just having uh, having really, a really solid approach to strain relief, something that simple makes a huge difference. And that is really shared between all of these different environments and disciplines. So <laughs> let's dig yeah. into that. So earlier, you said you were a mechie by training. Um, mm -hmm. Is that right? Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. uh, mechanical engineering in college. Uh, and yeah. you just mentioned being a kid and having like issues with strain relief and wires. What were you doing when you were a kid? Like, how did you get started in all this? Tell us about your trajectory. Yeah, um, I I just always loved just making things growing up. Um, my, my dad exposed me to various types of electronic building and we would kind of work on, we would solder stuff together. And, you know, most of it was beyond my ability to comprehend in terms of what was happening on a particular PCB. But um, just, I just remember being like, maybe the most excited I have ever been after finishing soldering a little like FM transmitter and we turned it on and suddenly our voice was coming over a radio. And it was just like mind blowing that something that we had just made with our hands could do something as kind of seemingly like, I don't know, professional, or uh, it, it just seemed like something that it was like, oh, you, you, you buy a thing that does this, you don't make it. And then suddenly we were making it. And that experience was just really, really powerful. Um, so, you know, I always love taking things apart and seeing how they work. And, uh, and so my mom is, um, she's an artist. So I, I sort of got this uh, kind of physics side of things from my dad and some artistic sides and you know sewing from my mom um mm. so it was yeah I, I really kind of appreciate that that combination of um experiences that i got growing up i love that that's kind of like both of your parents influences coming together in this vanessa carlton project yeah yeah totally um, so you mentioned uh some radio stuff like ham radio stuff and also when you were talking about the phone set how yeah. that was sort of beaming stuff down over ham radio and people were collaborating do you do any yeah. ham radio stuff these days I don't. Yeah, I'm a, <laughs> I'm a terrible. I, I have a license, but I'm a, I'm a terrible ham. Same. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I think I, I really, like I dial up a repeater every now and then, but that's it. Sorry, what was that? I said I think I like dial up a repeater every now and then, but that's mm, it. <laughs> nice, nice. Uh, someday. Yeah. Okay, let's see. Um, if you had unlimited resources. Is there like a total blue sky project that you would like to build? Any oh, size? Yeah. You know, I don't have anything in particular. Um, I would, um, with unlimited resources, I would 3D scanner, obviously. That, uh, right, right, right. That, that's the way I would go. I, I, would, I would invest in tools that um, allow me to work faster uh, so that then I could build kind of larger scale and more complicated things um, with a sort of equivalent amount of effort. Um, I, you know, I've, I've been thinking a little bit about what I want to do next. Um, you know, I'm, I'm kind of giving myself a, 
I'm allowing myself a break before I think about what I do professionally. But in terms of mm -hmm. fun projects, um, I, I always, um, growing up, I was, I feel like I was very heavily influenced by Mist. Um, do you remember this? <gasps> oh my gosh. Who among us was not influenced by Mist for sure. Yeah. Ugh. Just the gizmos in it and the, the ambiance and the vibe of it, I just thought was so powerful. And so like, it used to creep me out. Like I used to have to stop playing it because I was, I would just get like kind of freaked out. <laughs> have to it's stop. a totally creepy game. <laughs> it's very creepy. Um, yeah. But I, um, I also just, it just had some environments in it that were so creepy and cool and thought provoking um, that I would, I, I want to kind of somehow embody that vibe in whatever project I do next. And I don't know how to pull it off exactly, but I would love to make something where, you know, with this robot that I just finished, people kind of encounter it in the park and they, they, they love watching it. It's sort of a funny thing to see. It's entertaining. I think for the next project, I maybe want to make something that people encounter and they don't really know what to make of it, or they also maybe don't know whether they like it. I think that would be sort of a, a, an interesting Ooh. direction to go. Um, so I don't know. Um, I don't know what direction to take it exactly yet, but Mist is the vibe for sure. Yes. Oh, oh yeah. I would love to see okay. this. Uh so many different creepy vibes. I like that you say where people don't know whether they like it or not. It seems like you already made like a huge robot for Halloween, which was sort of creepy and also just like, but it's in such bright colors and stuff. But yeah. you could really dial up the weird and creepy on, on oh, yeah. <laughs> the new project. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think this is more just, you know, when you're, when you're a, a two foot tall child, um, a 15 foot tall pumpkin monster is maybe more intimidating to you than it would be to an adult so that's a good point yeah oh we have someone being very self-deprecating about their missed skills but you know when i was a kid mm. i absolutely used the walkthrough document like, oh there yeah was a lot of stuff it. Was... no it's it was like hard. an aesthetic <laughs> experience for me more than like a puzzle oh yeah absolutely yeah Same i, I actually that. recently replayed it i think i've um, when I when I have gotten COVID, I've allowed myself to replay Mist and uh, oh. uh, good distraction. And uh, and I, I think I was able to make it through without looking anything up. But you know that's after having played it probably three times as a kid already. So and I was still er barely able to get through. So yeah, it's it's mm -hmm. not a, not an easy thing. I have to mention real quick that uh, another huge aesthetic influence. For me, game wise, was Starship Titanic, which is this like Art Deco behemoth, also totally uh, even much more unplayable, honestly. Uh, huh. So awful. Uh, but it's based on a novel by Terry Jones and Douglas Adams, Terry Jones of uh, Monty Python, and okay. completely unplayable. But this most amazing <laughs> Art Deco style it was so pretty. Oh, uh, that's awesome. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, do it. Any yeah. other games that sort of influenced, or other other media that sort of influenced your visual style? You mentioned uh, puppets before. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm I'm sure I was influenced by Sesame Street pretty significantly growing up. Um, mm -hmm. I think there's a you know Sesame Street and the Muppets. I I think there's a level of um, not caring about whether a puppet is pristine, but rather caring about the emotions that it gets across. That's really cool. Mm. Um, like that, you know, Kermit is like, you can make a Kermit pretty, pretty easily, right? There's not a whole lot to it. Um, the, the joy comes from exactly how they have um, configured its face to, to um, produce certain emotional responses and how they, how they puppet it. Um, so I, I, I think it's really kind of cool, uh, what puppets like that can, can pull off. Uh, it doesn't need to be an ultra expensive, super high tech, um, sort of thing to, to really make people, uh, have a positive reaction to it and identify with it as a character. So, yeah. yeah, there's something about how his mouth moves where it's like, it's very much not just like a flat thing. It's got, it's very clear. Like sometimes he kind right. of scrunches it inwards and it's like totally. very clearly someone like, doing this with their hand <laughs> so mm -hmm. like <laughs> like facial expression yeah is like pleased <laughs> yeah i've heard that that's a very intentional aspect of it um yeah the, the ability to kind of form the mouth into various shapes with the hand it takes a lot of skill i assume to 
to puppeteer. Yeah. So we're coming around to the end of our interview here, and this has just been such a pleasure. Uh, of course, everyone, make sure to check out the links in the description of the video. Uh, we can just run through a few of these really quick. We've got uh, your uh, Benjamin.com. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> is that a, like a middle initial, or is it just because it's easy to get the domain? Um, people in high school called me Jamin, uh, ah. so I just... Yeah, it was free. <laughs> it feels uh, appropriate that you're jamming with robots now. Yeah. And actually, one of the most fun things about um, this puppet project has been that I've gotten to work really closely with my my high school friend, uh, Noah, oh. um, who, you know, we used to do video projects together when we were kids. And uh, and so it was he's he's now in the Bay Area. And it was just like it, he, he did. He actually did a lot of the um, the electronic guts for it. So he did. Um, some of some of the playback electronics that play back the the MIDI signals and the um, the audio. Um, right. So yeah, that's that's uh, Noah and his wife Lane there. Um, so he he actually does a lot of really cool stuff in um, energy grid monitoring in a variety of African Ooh, countries. Oh, so, cool! Yeah, maybe another person to <laughs> this is extremely relevant to my interests. It's it, yeah. Uh, so you've got those linked from your Twitter, uh, your tweet about the uh, robot. We've mm -hmm. also got your YouTube channel where you can find <laughs> this original robot. Also, these uh, very long-lived videos, they have a lot of longevity, this longevity and fluid on a speaker cone, acoustic streaming. This is just fascinating mm -hmm. very watching how you made a fireworks. Very random channel. <laughs> <laughs> and... Uh, Lots of other cool stuff to find on your website as well. Also, go check out the box shop. Yeah, is there anything? Like... Let's see. Uh, yeah, anything that you'd like to throw in there at the end? Uh, either advice for folks uh, who are looking to do similar things, who are just inspired by you, maybe. Hmm, that's interesting. I mean, I guess I think one thing that I've kind of taken from this is um, I in terms of like learning new skills, um, I, I, I tend to find that I'm, I'm sometimes a little bit reluctant to learn a new thing, to be honest. I, mm. um, I sometimes have a thing that I want to make and I'm like, Oh, I can't make it yet. Cause I don't know how to do all the things to make it. So I guess I have to learn these things. <laughs> and I'm always like super appreciative of, of the skills that I learn along the way, but it's never the thing that brings me joy in that moment. And boy, I mean, I think there's a lot of power in just picking a project that, in, is, is likely to incorporate some stuff that you don't know and just plowing ahead. I, I, I've had the most success with that. So I think that's my, my biggest takeaway from this project is, you know, there's, there's nothing wrong with just picking a project that you know is going to incorporate something you don't know how to do yet and just plowing ahead and figuring out who knows how to do it and talking with them and, and making it happen. So, mm. uh, On that note, uh, I noticed that you, you know, you collaborated with people and that's like on that same note in terms of like, if you don't have time to learn something new, that's something that I'm really trying to work on. It's like mm. collaborating with people. Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which is another way to like get past that, but then you don't get those skills yourself. Although maybe yeah. your friend teaches you some stuff. Like, did you learn anything from your friends while, while building this project? Oh yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. It, I mean, th there were, there were certain points at which I, was just so stumped uh, that I, <laughs> I had to had to just bring bring people in. Um, we we had an uh, an issue with uh, audio and puppet sync, uh, mm. which you would think wouldn't be an issue. Um, crystal oscillators should be more than capable of keeping things in sync over the course of three minutes to the level of human perception. But <laughs> it turns out if those oscillators aren't uh, enabled by default in your microcontroller, then it's running off the RC oscillator and. <gasps> As soon as you take your puppet to Twin Peaks and the temperature is in the 40s with the wind whipping around it, huh. it starts to not work so well. So um, that that was that was beyond my ability to solve. So I, I had to bring in the uh, the hive mind for that. Huh. <laughs> cool. Okay, yeah. I actually have one final question for you. Sure. Um, I know that you're not directly working in space anymore, or you know, on on space robots, but. Mm -hmm. uh, is there something that you're excited about that maybe you saw recently uh, that gets you excited about the future of space technology? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I think um, I, I'm on, 
I'm excited about some things and I'm I'm bummed about some other things. Oh, do tell. Uh, I think I think the last um, the last five or ten years has been a really exciting time in aerospace when there have been a lot of startups, including Planet, that have taken a more iterative, lower cost approach to mm -hmm. developing space technology and integrating more off the shelf components than a, a typical aerospace company would. Um, it also feels like there's been kind of a recent reckoning there, <laughs> like maybe things went a little bit too far. Um, I think that there was a lot of knowledge that was generated in that time um, that I'm really hoping can be uh, continually applied to aerospace projects. And, you know, I mean, I think NASA has taken note and is maybe better about uh, also incorporating lower cost, more iterative projects in the portfolio of, of NASA programs. Um, and, but I think also um, there were a lot of really like great components that were generated in that time. Um, like uh, electric propulsion now is much more accessible than it used to be. Um, and that enables lots of capabilities that you didn't have maybe 15 years ago, at least for that price point. Um, so I think, I think we'll start to see more um, kind of lower cost exploration mis missions that leverage um, electric propulsion. Uh, so that's, that's potentially very exciting. Electric propulsion. Yeah, I didn't know this was any, even a thing. So, is it like once they're already in orbit, like say launched from like the ISS or something, then they're able mm -hmm. to? Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so it's um, with propulsion, it's always a trade-off between energy and mass. Um, you can put a ton of energy into the propulsion, or well, you can put a ton of energy into the propulsion and use very little mass because you're shooting the mass at the back super fast or you can put a lot of mass into it and throw it out the back very slowly and just use chemical mm. energy. So, you know, for instance, like uh, a chemical thruster, like an Estes rocket engine um, is very um, mass inefficient, but very energy efficient, right? It contains all the energy that it needs right in that little motor. Mm. Whereas electric propulsion um, uses uh, externally collected electricity to provide the energy for the propulsion and then uses that to accelerate typically an in inert gas at the back. So there, there are trade-offs associated with these, but um, you know, you can, you can, if you have enough time, you could send a CubeSat out of the solar system uh, with an electric propulsion system. So uh, that's maybe not true, but <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to fact check that. <laughs> well, thanks for the uh, answering my ambush question. <laughs> we are at the top of the hour. So Thank you, everyone, for joining us and tuning in. Uh, we love to see your comments and stuff. Uh, be happy to continue seeing those come up on YouTube and stuff. Ben, what a joy! Uh, ah, I, I can't believe that I rode around on this thing before, and now it's, like, blown up on the internet. But also, <laughs> like, I can't, I hope I get to see it, like, rambling around SF at some point, and we got to get together and, and do some mandolin jams. Absolutely. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it was super fun. Yeah! All right, cheers, everybody. Hack on! <laughs>